Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 184. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Some men never grow up. I've known men in their 60s who were going on 16. Other men are like me. I didn't grow up until after I became a Catholic. But the man we have on today is in college, and he's more of a man than most who are twice as old as him. This is for six-pack warriors who are interested in learning to make money online. Earlier this year, ClickBank made a shocking announcement. In a mere 12 months, a small group of ClickBank users made a total of $25,690,213. But here's where it gets crazier. None of them were online business experts. In fact, before that 12 months, they were just regular ClickBank users who'd never made a dime online. Many of them had day jobs or other commitments and just did ClickBank on the side. But there's one thing they all had in common. All of them used my friend Robbie Blanchard's simple three-step system to succeed. Now, in case you haven't heard of him, Robbie Blanchard is the number one ClickBank affiliate. Due to all the success he's had from promoting ClickBank products for high commission, Robbie's put together a free training where you'll learn the same system he used to have such massive success. In this training, Robbie will show you how to make $1,000 a day promoting informative products that people are dying to use, how to use the power of Facebook to find huge pockets of untapped buyers, why making $1,000 a day is actually easy to do and just takes three steps, why you need zero experience to have success with this system. You're not going to want to miss this free training if you're looking to generate $1,000 a day. Click the link in my show notes that says how to make $1,000 a day with ClickBank offers for the free training. 
In September last year, we had Joe Riggi on the show. He's the college-age founder of the Our Warpath Apostolate. When I first met Joe last year, I was so impressed with his maturity and depth of spirituality that I just had to have him on for Toxic Mail Month. For a change, I don't have any commentary on the things he says in this interview. Just listen and enjoy. Perhaps he'll give you hope for our younger adult generation. I know he has me. Six-pack warriors, we have Joe Riggy of the Our Warpath Apostolate. Uh, it's been a year since we've had him on here. I think it's about a year, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, about a year, I think. Yeah, so we're glad to have you back on the show. Say hello to the folks. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, Joe, thank you so much for having me back on the podcast. As usual, it's a pleasure. You and I email back and forth, just communicating information and, um, you know, just to say hello sometimes, but it's good to be back on and talk to you about important topics. Yes, and this particular topic is important. Uh, in fact, I want to ask you, you know, Gay Pride Month is in June. Mm-hmm. So is the month of the Sacred Heart. So yeah. Gay Pride Month is a diabolical attack on the Sacred Heart and masculinity. So tell me what you thought whenever I told you that I wanted to use the show to launch Toxic Male Month in June to combat what's going on. What'd you think about that? I thought it was a great idea. We're really in an interesting and perverted world. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of just a that's kind of just a nice way to say it. I think everything that's going on seems to be upside down, and I think the month of June is is. You know, you see gay pride flags everywhere, no matter where you go, even if you're in a more conservative area. I'm down here in, in Boise, Idaho, and Idaho is supposed to be conservative, but, you know, the, the city down here, Boise, they have their pride parade. Uh, so it is very gross, and it's put in that month of June. And I, I, I can't say if they did it purposely to have it in that month of June or not, but it's in the month where the Catholic Church dedicates the month to the sacred heart of Jesus, which is supposed to be, well, sacred. And it's supposed to be a month where we're really dedicating ourselves. Um, and, you know, for, some, for like our war path, we do a lot of, during the, the month of the sacred heart in June, we do the novena of the sacred heart every day. And then with other sacrifices as well, because we think that's a good way to, to kind of counter that. But unfortunately it seems like we almost lost that fight in a sense uh culturally culturally at least you know pride month is continuing and it seems that we've just moved on to the next battle we've moved on to abortion and while yes we should stop abortion we shouldn't just run away from a fight because the majority says it's okay now so I, I think it's important that we combat this. So I think it's important that what you're doing during the month of June is talking about masculinity, talking about important topics uh, related to masculinity, because it's something we need to bring back. And if we're able to bring masculinity back, proper masculinity, then we're able to kind of it, – it's possible to reverse something. It would be very difficult to revert – gay marriage laws or things like that but it's not impossible yeah i i absolutely agree you know while you were speaking i was thinking about my own life i'm i'm 64 years old when i have watched the homosexual lobby go from whenever i was a child in most states uh homosexual activity would result in a prison sentence And then they just said, we want it to be treated like everybody else. Yeah. And it went from there to having it shoved down our throats. They wanted uh, all kind of special rights just for Mm -hmm. their sexual preferences. And, uh, you know, they even want marriage, which is not possible. 
I so yeah, I think Toxic Male Month is very important. Listen, Joe, describe for us what you believe strong and proper masculinity should be. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think people would have different answers, but essentially masculinity, and especially specifically when we're speaking about Catholic masculinity, which if a man is going to, I think if any man is is trying to be a man, I guess, trying to be masculine, whether he's Catholic or not, it's going to lead him to that Catholic idea. And I think essentially the ideal man, the ideal masculine man is Christ. We look at him and he's the ideal man, man, God, I guess you would have to say, but what has he done? What did he do in his time on earth that we must try to follow the, follow the example. And so he died for us. He took beatings for us. He led for us. So there, there, there's so much that he did in his life and everything that he did in his life is an example of how we should live our lives. And then from there on, you have, well, who else can we imitate in order to be true masculine men? And that's the lives of the saints because essentially they're a reflection of Christ as well, what they Amen. did as well. And so I think – we have to look at those we have to look at the people that went before us and so a proper proper masculinity is i think one of the key elements of that is sacrifice and that's something that we don't see in our society today so sacrifice another key element is taking accountability for your actions which is another thing we don't see in our lives and that kind of and that deals with leadership as well leader is going to be able to take accountability for his actions uh, so those are two very key factors as well and then being able to deny yourself um, which deals with sacrifice as well but i think so many men today can't even deny themselves the most simple of pleasures. So if we can't discipline ourselves in the most basic of levels, we're never going to be able to reach that ideal, which is Christ. Um, and at the end of the day, our lives are meant to be an invitation of his life. And when we die, I think uh, there, there's a moment in the Bible where Christ says, go away from me. I know you not. And that's a, that's a, those are words that will be said to people on their day of judgment if he looks at their soul and he does not see a reflection of himself. And so Amen. they're very frightening words. And I think when we're trying to, if we want to be masculine, if we want to be true men, we have to take the time to self-reflect and take the time to to ponder, okay, how are we imitating Christ? And if we look in the mirror and we only see ourselves in what we want, then we're not doing the right thing. We're not being men. Um, but if we look in the mirror and we see Christ in what we're doing, then we're on the proper, proper path. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking while you were talking about Jesus sacrificing himself for us and the things he did, that was certainly courageous, but he was uh, he demonstrated courageous throughout his entire public yeah. ministry. Um, for example, well, truth is what he defended 100% of the time. And because of that truth, uh, his courage really showed. The uh, uh, He called men publicly. He called them hypocrites yeah. and liars and uh, uh, white-painted sepulchers full of dead men's bones. I think at one point he even called some murders, and uh, uh, he drove people out of the temple with a whip. That doesn't sound like a guy who's the warm fuzzy they made him out to be these days. Yeah, they they they've they painted people with they painted the saints in Christ with rosy cheeks and you know <laughs> tan skin and curly hair. You know, not to say they didn't have curly hair, but they've made them look very feminine. A feminine, it take, yeah, yeah. It, it takes away from from who they were, 
and we actually had a good article on that um that one of our staff members wrote and it was called prayers for pansies and what he does and and he has experience because he he's an artist and he he sculpts and he he's able to i mean he's he's very good but what he was showing is you know we we've really watered down catholic art to where we look at angels and we see like these chubby people with wings and pink cheeks whereas when we look at the devil we are frightened when we see images of the devil but we're not stricken with anything but the feminacy when we see the saints well in fact a lot of the angel uh artwork is not only children but women and there are no women angels uh god created male period Female came from the male, so. Uh, oh there's well, actually, that's... There's, there's actually. Have you ever seen the movie that, A Hidden Life? No, I have not. A very good film. Uh, it's about a Catholic, uh, Austrian, who, in the time when Hitler was waging war, they basically they tried to. Um, well, they were getting people to enlist in the military. And he said no, because it's a true story. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, that's against what I believe. I'm not, I can't go, you know, it's an unjust war, what he's doing. And anyways, they, they put him in a, you know, they tortured him and stuff like that. But something very interesting in the movie, and he's actually a blessed now, but something very interesting in the movie, there's an artist who's in the church and he's talking to the artist. Because he's asking me, you know, what should I do and things like that. And the artist explains that, you know, I don't have the courage to to paint a true Christ. And he kind of asked him, well, what do you mean? And he said, I paint the Christ that people want to see. People want to see a Christ they can relate to. They don't want to see a Christ nailed to the cross. They don't want to see a bleeding Christ because they know they'll have to live like that. And so... Right now, I paint the Christ people want to see because I don't have the courage to paint the Christ they need to see. I'm paraphrasing, but basically what he's saying is we have those images. What we're seeing today on Holy Cards are these cheesy saints, these cheesy Christs. These are images that are, you know, they enable a kind of softness of the will. And so we like that because we don't want to see a suffering Christ because we don't want to be reminded that we need to be suffering. We need to be courageous. We need to be, have this, this, this spirit of self-denial uh, until we have the courage to see the angels as, you know, warriors ready to destroy the enemy or St. Anthony. He wasn't this cheesy saint. He was a hammer of heretics. Yeah. So until we're able to see that, uh, we're not going to be able to make any progress. I absolutely agree with you on that. Courage is defined by what we give of ourselves, not what we take. Yeah. And uh, uh, and incidentally, when you began describing the movie, I do remember having seen it. So yeah. it's it's been quite a while, but yeah. Uh, Joe, what's your opinion about how the prevalent culture views men? Oh, our, our, our culture hates men. <laughs> you can just put it. It's as simple as that. It, it really does. Um, and people would say, well, the whole culture doesn't hate men. Well, it's like, well, maybe not, but at least mainstream in the most, um, I guess that's the, that's most of what is in your face as far as the media and academia as well, like in college most college professors, the majority of them that at least I've taken um, classes from, they hate manliness. They hate true men. And our society does too. They don't want men to to lead. They want women to lead. They don't want men to be to to be courageous. They want men to be shut down. They want their courage to be shut down. So we're living again like you mentioned or yeah like you mentioned earlier it, it's a perverse world and 
every they want everything to be upside down. They they've been wanting this though for such a long time, and people think it's some kind of conspiracy. No, it's not. This is the devil is not a conspiracy. This is how the devil works. And so, how do we get to this point of society hating men? We can go all the way back to when it first started. Really, divorce is kind of the beginning of it all. Why do they want to break up the family? Amen. They allow divorce to break that family up so that you could have men and women. It wasn't just so that a woman can go find another man. No, it's so man and woman can have independency. And then from there, what did they do? From there, they wanted to enable, you know, abortion. And then that gives not only a woman more independency, but I don't need a man in my life. This is my body. I get to choose. I don't care about this person in my my womb. Gives them more of this sense of I can do whatever I want and man is not in charge of me. And then from there, we move to homosexuality, which like you already mentioned, they as they pushed it, they said it's not going to affect you. But of course it's affected us. And again, we're going more into this inverse nature. It's unnatural. It's something that shouldn't happen. Yet they enable that because it pushes further the breakdown of the family that you can kind of go do things with the same gender. And guess what? The end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. That cannot happen in a homosexual relationship. And then from right. there, where we are now, listen, we backed away from the divorce fight. The abortion fight, we lost in a sense, but we're still fighting it, of course, because we have you know the March for Life. And we have some great movements that are still fighting that. And we've made a lot – I have to say we've made a lot of progress in trying to shut it down again. So again, it's possible. The war on homosexuality, we lost that as well. And it seems like we've totally – we're not even fighting it against it anymore, it seems like. We gave Especially, up. Yeah, it seems like we gave up. And now it's like, well, we just move on to the next problem because we lost another thing. So now we're on to transgenderism. And, and so it's just gotten so crazy. But again, if you have weak men – you will have a weak society. That's as simple as it is. And That's it comes true. back to it comes back to you and I as Catholics. If St. Augustine, who I've been really into St. Augustine lately because he's got some great content, but Yes, he does. He he says, paraphrasing, he says, We are the times. As Catholics live, so will be the times. And if you look in the history of the church, when the Catholic Church was flourishing, so was society. When the Catholic Church was not doing what it was supposed to be doing, society was crumbling. And so we're looking looking today at our society. We're seeing a crumbling society, but we're also seeing a crumbling church in a sense. And this idea of coming back to masculinity, society hates masculinity society society hates men and it's, it's for no reason it's you look in our church we're not seeing leaders in our church which is a key element to being a man leadership courage self-denial sacrifice we're not seeing that in our church right now are we we're seeing that among no, not very at all. few catholic clergy so it comes back to us it comes back to the catholic church if Catholics are weak, so will society be. Amen. You're absolutely right. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more shortly. Let's get back to your college experience. You yeah. mentioned uh, professors and, and the way they promote. Oh, I, I, I don't know whether they're promoting feminism or homosexuality per se, but they certainly are against uh masculinity correct yeah 100 percent sure and, and 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 they're promoting you know every class i seem to be in they're promoting transgenderism they're promoting okay uh, homosexuality they're promoting and it's not even like they're they're not promoting true feminism they're promoting this extreme feminism that again it comes back to if you are a man who is 
you if you are a heterosexual man, you have no say in this because it has nothing to do with you. They really want to put down. Actually, they think we don't even have a right to express an opinion, do they? Yeah, they 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 don't because they say, well, you're not gay, you're not transgender, you're not a woman, so you can't talk on these subjects. Well, and so okay. they really want to push that down. Okay, so professors aside, like I say, you're a student right now, so do you think the campus culture of professors aside, do you think the cat, uh, campus culture is tolerant of strong masculinity? Or do you feel it's uh, discouraged or encouraged? How how do things look outside the classroom on campus? I think that I think that there are my college, but my college culture. I think there are a lot of you know the loudest voices seem to be tend to be the crazy people, the wokest, the leftist. They tend to be the loudest voices. And that's the issue. I think there are a lot of people that want true masculinity. There are a lot of people that want to bring back manly men. However, the issue is no one has the courage to do it because the students who hate men, the students that hate masculinity, are again the loudest students. And they will go after you for doing something I guess you could say virtuous, you know, in my class, I got yelled at for standing up for what I believe in. And it turns out as a week went by, two weeks went by, more and more people in my class kept reaching out to me saying, thank you so much for what you did. And so I'm thinking to myself, there's a lot more conservative minded because again, they're probably a little bit liberal in their thinking, but there is a conservative or traditional minded person there somewhere because they they did agree with me the problem was they didn't have the courage to stand up and defend what I was defending so i think i think i guess you i could say the mainstream culture of the college campuses no it it, it doesn't like masculinity it doesn't like men but i think there are many on a college campus that want to bring it back, they simply don't have the courage to bring it back. So it's, you know, when you're dealing with the battle when it comes to education, that's tough, especially when it comes to college kids. But unfortunately, what happens is if you become in the habit of not defending your beliefs, you'll soon believe what you're being taught. And I think a lot of these kids, a lot of these students, and I, I've even known some in my class who've gone from kind of thinking more or less along the lines of what I think. And over the course of two, three years, they've gone totally the other way. And it's because they've never had the guts to stand up for what they believe in. And so finally it's been, it's been pushed so much and imprinted so much on their mind that they finally just accept it. And, and it's the idea of indoctrination. It, it's a real thing. People don't think it happens, but it does. Indeed it does. And I want to point out one thing from what you said. Uh, this is not to uh, slap you on the back and tempt your ego. It's to be a lesson to six-pack warriors. Joe Riggy was in a very hostile environment. He was a man. He stood up for what he believed. He got shouted down. He got yelled at. Yet other people later came to him because they recognized the courage in a real man and they recognized the leadership in a real man. Joe, thank you for doing that because uh, if more men will have the guts to stand up and do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, yeah. I think we could begin to turn this around. Uh, as a young man, do you generally feel your input and participation in the parishes that you've been in is welcome, or do you feel like a man's being placed on the outside? I think the parishes that I have attended definitely, definitely welcome the involvement of men, especially young men, young adults. They really want them to step up because 
um, they realize that's the way of the Catholic faith. Men lead, and that's not to leave women out of it. Again, man and woman are meant to be – that's why you have the family unit. They're meant to complement each other. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's man's duty to lead. And so Amen. I think I think Catholic – many of the Catholic parishes that I've been to – really do promote this idea of get involved in the parish. We want you involved. We want you to be active and to organize events or to teach catechism or whatever it may be. They want them to, they want men to get involved. I think the problem is, unfortunately, young men don't want to get involved with it necessarily a, a, a Catholic parish or a Catholic apostolate. They don't want to get involved because there's there's this idea that it's not it's it's still around there's this idea that it's not cool to be catholic it's not cool to be virtuous it's not cool to pray a rosary it's not cool to pray it, it's a common idea among young adults it's a common i see it among many of my friends you know like they don't think you can be normal and have a a prayer for life or be like sorry i can't do this right now i got to go pray my rosary that's weird to them. And that's what's wrong in our society today. That used to be so normal once upon a time in the Catholic Church where people prayed together. Not only did the family pray together, but Catholic communities came together and prayed with each other. And it wasn't weird to say that we're going to pray the rosary. It wasn't weird to say that we're going to mass in the morning. That wasn't weird, but it's so foreign to people now. And it's unfortunate because they don't – it comes down to they just don't really know their faith. I think True. people misunderstand the faith to be something weird. You're like if you're strong Catholic, you're weird. But the funny thing is the strongest Catholics I know are the mo- not only the most manliest men I know but – or some of the strongest Catholics I know are actually women as well. But they're the greatest to be around. You enjoy their company the most because you're dealing with something, someone that elevates you. And I think that's what you have. That's what our goals should be. And I've gotten to that stage where, you know, when you're when you're younger and you're just going to college, you kind of want to have fun and things like that. And like. I never I started a war path. Literally, it was providential. It was my first semester of college. But. It was something that kind of was providential, I think, in that it got me to take accountability of my actions and say, no, you can't be part of this drinking culture or part of this college culture. You have to do this. This is your Catholic mission. This is your apostolate. But again, Catholic young adults don't want to do that. They just want to, you know, swearing is still cool. Drinking and getting drunk is still cool. Drugs is still cool. It's just the Catholic faith is not cool to them. And they, if they truly understood the faith, they would realize. Amen. The faith is kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> so hurry. we we got to get people to understand that, especially young adults. So back to the question: the all the church parishes that I've attended really want Catholic young men to get involved, but and even Catholic men of families to get involved, but unfortunately, they just don't. Well, your experience is a little different than mine, but. I have been in parishes all across the country, uh, good ones, bad ones, in between ones. <laughs> oh, uh, and bet. it's been my experience that in the majority of Catholic parishes, being a man works against you. We have an effeminate episcopate for the most part. Mm-hmm. We have an effeminate <clears throat> priesthood for the most part. Yeah. And we have women who pretty much taken over the parishes. So, but it all boils back down to the one thing you brought up, and it's the one thing I harp on week after week after week. The bishops haven't taught the faith for 60 years, 70 years. Yeah. Yep. And so, Catholics are completely or almost completely ignorant of the Catholic faith. And that's why 
it's not cool because they don't know it. Yeah, I yeah. became a Catholic simply because once it was explained to me, I got excited. To me, Catholicism is the most exciting lived experience you can have, mm-hmm. period. So, uh, but yeah, yeah people, I go ahead. People can't, uh, people can't, I, I, I did some research and they did kind of like these polls on why Catholics were leaving the Catholic Church. And one very interesting element was that the common theme and the answers that were given was that they weren't able to differentiate Catholicism from other religions, which just shows you how watered down the faith has been, how yep. watered down Catholic bishops and Catholic priests not doing their duty, um, unfortunately, and it shown. And so Catholics leave because they're like, well, why would I want to be part of this? There's no different than me being Catholic or Christian. And so, like you said, originally it got you, it got you so excited and the Catholic faith, I mean, you, you, of course, you of course understand it in a way that it probably still excites you in that way. But when a newcomer or worse, when someone who has been struggling with the faith sees that it's been very watered down, that's something that's going to perhaps not have a good effect on them and maybe even cause them to leave the church, unfortunately. That's true. That's very true. And I deal with that from listeners and readers every single week. You know, people want to leave the church, and if they understood what the church teaches, they'd also understand they condemn their own souls to hell if they yep. leave. Yep. So, okay, let's let's wrap this up, Joe, with a two-part question. Sure. Uh, what should we men do to defend our proper masculine role in society, and what should we do in order to reassert our proper place within the Catholic Church? Good questions. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think it comes back to our, our our the answer to our first question. We need to imitate Christ. Amen. And you brought this up actually, um, and I should have incorporated my answer, but we need to defend the truth at all costs. Amen. We aren't doing that currently. We're too weak to do that, and so it comes back to us. It comes back to Catholics. If Catholics are strong, society is going to be strong. If Catholics are weak, society is going to be weak. And so in order for us to become strong, we need to get rid of this kind of effeminacy in our lives as men. And I don't mean effeminacy in the way that most people are thinking, like, oh, it means that we're kind of woman-like. No, no, no. Effeminacy in the way that Effeminacy is a softness of the will. So many of us are constantly desiring to live in this habitual state of entertainment, which leads us to live passive lives and to just be there, not doing anything. We're just a blob. We're just basically like in the Bible, a reed shake in the wind. Wherever the wind goes, so do we. And so we have to reassert ourselves by reflecting on what are we doing in our personal lives and if we look in the mirror and just see us doing whatever the heck we want then we're doing we're doing wrong the catholic life there's no other way to say it the catholic life is painful it Amen. involves suffering it involves the cross without the cross heaven is impossible hey, if we yeah. embrace if we embrace the cross heaven is inevitable so we have to understand that and People don't, but if if we want to bring build back society, we have to start with the foundation, and we have to have the courage to say, you know what, I don't believe what you're saying, and I'm going to defend my God. I'm going to defend my faith, because if we don't defend it, we're basically fighting for the other side. You're absolutely right, and you know the neat thing about defense, the other side can use nothing but subjective arguments to defend their yeah, side. That's true. We can prove every single doctrine and dogma of the Catholic faith. We yep. can prove it. They can't do that. Ours is objective. Theirs is subjective. Yep. It's just a matter of being courageous. Well, first of all, learn the faith. 
then being courageous enough to stand up for it. That's what it takes. And there's so little courage. You know, we've got uh, maybe eight bishops in this country who are orthodox and don't mind spouting that. Mm -hmm. But with the exception of one who seems to be coming out of this, they're all cowards. You take uh, Archbishop Cordelion in uh, San Francisco. He's been talking about uh, uh, not receiving the Eucharist if you support abortion. Yet, I noticed Nancy Pelosi hasn't been told she can't receive the Eucharist. Yeah. You know, that's yep. cowardice. That yep, is, is cowardice. Now, you know, cu- courage for men, courage is... I will stand up. I will fight. I'm willing to sacrifice my life yeah. for this thing. And of course, <laughs> the first place I learned about that was in the United States Army. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I've had to face the possibility of, of, uh, martyrdom or the probability of martyrdom three times in the church. Uh, and I'm at a point right now where I don't care what anybody says or thinks. I'm going to do what's got to be done. I know you're a man like that too. And that is what we have to do to reassert, uh, our masculinity, yep. our masculinity. But what do we do to try to, I mean, look, between the lavender mafia and, so many homosexuals being actively promoted into the priesthood and up through the hierarchy and women, which started out because men didn't want to do the job in the first place. So women get end up taking leadership roles in parishes. How do we get rid of that? How do we, uh, how do we reassert our proper role in the church? Yeah, I think an important aspect of that is not only ourselves doing the right thing, but coming together as Catholic communities to do the right thing. And so if you are in a parish, you need to – and one of one of um, the men on our staff is doing this. He's, he's not only – taking accountability for his actions but he's doing what he what must be done as a catholic and he's also organized a catholic group of men in his parish who are have challenges that they need to do have readings they need to do have spiritual duties that they need to do have Amen. duties in the church they need to do whether that be teaching young kids how to serve how to to set up the altar how to usher how to sing in the choir these are many things that they're being taught but it, there are many things that they're just saying you know what we're sick of this we're taking charge as catholic men and so what happens and of course the priest is very encouraging of this like good i'm glad catholic men are finally stepping up because the priest can only you can only promote this idea of catholic masculinity so much you can't force someone to do it you can just keep promoting and encouraging it and it's actually finally born that fruit and so they're doing that and when something you know they've really taken taken charge in the church and when something isn't right they come together as a catholic men's group and they they approach it and they say we're not standing for this so whether that be whether that be something going on in the church or whether that be there's a pro-choice rally, and so they say we need to go fight this. So they bring their men's group <laughs> down there. So, so the, there are many ways that we can do this, but I think we have to unite, and we have to be united front. I think the Catholic within the Catholic Church, there's a, there's this lack of fellowship between Catholics when really we need to come together, we need to fight together, and most importantly. We need to hold our Catholic clergy accountable. And Amen. for some people that sounds so bold and something that like we should know there are there are priests and bishops and leaders. No, 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 no. Yes, they are, but it's our job. If our Catholic leaders are not leading, it is our job to say, you are not leading and we will hold you accountable. 
you are a priest in our parish. You are promoting things that are anti-Catholic. And so guess what? We are not no longer funding this parish. We Amen. are no longer attending this parish. We need to use the exact tactics for virtuous ends, obviously not doing anything immoral, but we need to use very similar tactics to what the other side is using against us. Cancel Amen. culture. Cancel culture, while it is crazy to us, because of course we do believe in the Catholic Church in forgiveness, so I don't think we should cancel people in the sense of never forgiving them, but I do believe that we should we should hold the Catholic clergy accountable in the sense that, you know what, if you are going to be the bishop of our diocese and you're going to promote this anti-Catholic agenda, then we are going to get together as a Catholic unit. We are going to start a petition. If we can't stop you from doing this, we will pull all of your funding until you have to do what we say because that's the only way to be done. We want it to Amen. be done the Catholic way. And so I, I think when it comes down to we need to – we need to come together, and uh, fortunately, you know, our Warpath actually has some things in the works, which I'll, I'll definitely be sharing with you after this podcast. Uh, but <laughs> it, it 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 it's crazy. The first step is taking accountability individually, but then it's like you said, coming back to the idea of having the courage and that leadership. It involves building an army. The Catholic Church is an, is an army, you know, and so I I feel like we're dealing. Every every generation has their new kind of persecution, I think, and we definitely have a persecution going on, and I think we're dealing with another sort of crusade. I I I think Christ wants another crusade, and it's it may not be swords and shields, or it may not be guns, but it's going to be words. It's going to be uh funds you know money it's going to take another another form but i think in order to do this crusade we need to create and again this is like this is something that our warpath and many other organizations and people like you are trying to do like you're building a catholic podcast army this is something you're trying to do in order to get catholics to have the courage to lead have the courage to stand up what they believe in even if it means sacrificing their own life. Absolutely. And Six Back Warriors, I want to reiterate, you cannot lead, you cannot fight, you cannot do anything masculine, and of course 61% of you listeners are men, if you don't live the faith. And you can't live the faith if you don't know the faith. Yep, And I know for a fact that at least 95% of you, no matter what you think, you don't know the faith. On my show notes is a link that says, I want to learn more about the Catholic faith. Click on that thing, sign up for the free email course, start getting invitations to the weekly webinars that I do. I'll teach you the Catholic faith, hook or crook. And I do so under the direction of Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke. Now, if you don't know his name, you're not even trying to live your faith. The Okay, Joe, I appreciate this, and I hope that at least one person out of these uh, nearly 62,000 uh, six-pack of warriors, at least one person will stand up and say, you know, I need to start an apostolate that will organize men in parishes across the country. Yeah. I really hope so. Joe, I appreciate you being here. We've uh, long run out of time. Yeah, so, we have. Uh, will you come back on again uh, next year? Oh, yeah, 100% sure. I love talking to you about the Catholic faith and just talking to you in general. Always a pleasure. So whenever the next invite comes... As always, we'll keep in contact, but when the next invite comes, I'll be sure to accept. Amen. Thank you, Joe. We'll see you again. God bless. God bless. Just a word about Joe's apostolate, Our Warpath. The Our Warpath apostolate was designed for young people, but it seems that it has members of all ages and walks of life. I think you should at least check it out. 
visit cantankerouscatholic.com and find this episode. Click on the title, then scroll down below the podcast player to my show notes. You'll find a link to our warpath. Are you struggling to lose weight no matter how much you diet and exercise? Turns out it's not your fault. A 2022 study published in Nature Medicine of 52,000 women and men found just one factor in every overweight man and woman, low brown epidose tissue levels. They also found in skinny people high brown epidose tissue levels. Brown epidose tissue, also known as brown fat, isn't fat at all. It's not a fat store, but a fat shrinker. Its brown color comes from its densely packed mitochondria, which works 24-7 to burn calories from your fat stores and the foods you eat into pure natural energy. Even though the brown fat makes up a fraction of your weight, it can burn up to 300 times more calories than any other cell in your body. That's the reason they created Exapure. Exapure is unlike anything you've ever tried or experienced in your life. It's the only product in the world with a proprietary blend of eight exotic nutrients and plants designed to target low brown fat levels, the newly found root cause of your unexplained weight gain. Every tiny increase in brown fat means a huge jump in calorie and fat burning and energy levels. Want to lose weight and keep it off? Go to the show notes for this episode and click on the Exapure link to find out more. but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. There was once a lion that had grown too old to be able to hunt for his food, so he decided instead to acquire his prey by trickery. He would lay in his den and pretend to be very sick. He made certain everyone knew the king of the beast was so ill, so they would all come and pay homage to him. Each animal of nature would come to visit the lion to honor the old king, but the lion took advantage of their trust and naivety and would devour them. After many of the animals had disappeared, the sly fox figured out what had happened. He too went to visit the lion to pay homage, but remained outside the cave. How are you? asked the fox. I'm very ill, replied the lion. Won't you please come in and sit with me for a while? No, thank you, said the fox. A lot of my friends are missing, and I can't help but notice that there are many footprints entering your cave, but I see none coming out again. In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, our first pope wrote, Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. The lion in our story is like the devil. Satan is a trickster, and he always has been. Jesus said in John 8:44, He was a murderer from the beginning, and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is a deceiver, and his favorite deception is to convince mankind he doesn't exist, that he's merely a boogeyman, a myth made up to frighten children into behaving themselves. The world no longer believes in Satan, but his evil is evident all around us. The devil tempts us with great subtlety. Examples in modern times are found in the legislation of abortion and same-sex unions. 
Playing on our sympathies, the devil told us that surely it would be cruel for a woman to have to carry a product of rape or incest, or that the life of the mother is certainly more important than a life that hasn't seen the light of day. The play on our sympathies about rape and incest seemed reasonable at first glance, but as Catholics who obey God's commands, we know that compounding one mortal sin with another of taking a human life is wrong, and it's a crime worthy of eternal punishment. We learn that the threat to the life of a mother who is pregnant is defined as her emotional health, which tells us the devil tricked us from the beginning. Notice how the devil leads people to change our language. A woman isn't carrying a baby in her womb, but rather a product of conception, dehumanizing the preborn child so it becomes easier to abort, like excising a tumor. The devil used the homosexual lobby to lie to us. Homosexuals first told us they only wanted to live out who they were, free from the fear of being discriminated against. They told us they would never ask for special rights and that they only wanted to feel safe in society. That was a lie. They next began to demand special rights on the basis of how they chose to pervert themselves and their sexual activities, telling us we must accept how they live. Then they demanded the right to be married, something that's not possible either theologically or philosophically. And the devil uses his deceptions to make us feel like bigots if we oppose the destructive force of homosexuality as something normal. It's not normal. Sodomy is one of the mortal sins that cries out to God from the earth for justice, which is why God destroyed two cities for this perversion. They changed the language, just like the abortion lobby. They hijack the word gay to mean homosexual, but that isn't what it means at all. Until the 1970s, gay meant lighthearted, carefree, happy. I've worked with many homosexual men over the last 30 years, leading some of them to a chaste life as Catholics. I've never met a practicing homosexual who is happy. Many put on a good front of happiness, but it doesn't take long in listening to them to realize they aren't happy at all. Indeed, no one living in a state of chronic mortal sin is happy, whether homosexual or heterosexual. Not only does Satan tempt us as a society, but he very subtly tempts us individually. It's easy to justify what we want to do so to avoid doing what we ought to do. The man who says to himself that he works hard all week, so there is nothing wrong with getting hammered after work on Friday night, is justifying doing what he wants, despite the fact that God tells us drunkenness is a sin. The woman who tells herself the summer weather is hot and nobody any longer believes explodes The woman who tells herself the summer weather is hot and nobody any longer believes exposing bare flesh is wrong dresses in grave violation of the Sixth Commandment, tempting men, and sometimes other women, by dressing in ways that would have landed them in jail 50 years ago and labeled them as loose women. It doesn't matter what modern society thinks, but rather the only unchangeable laws of an unchangeable God. We Catholics have bought into the modern culture's lies, which are the devil's lies. We've accepted the moral errors of situation ethics and fundamental option. Situation ethics is an error that contends moral decisions shouldn't be based on moral laws, but on the specific particular situation in which a person finds himself. Since the situation is unique and unrepeatable, the person's conscience alone is to determine the right moral decision, apart from any law or principle. The fundamental error of situation ethics is that it's incompatible with the fact that God gave us a set of moral norms to judge what is right and what is wrong. They're called the Ten Commandments. The church has always taught that there are some acts which are intrinsically good and some which are intrinsically evil, apart from any circumstances. A good example of situation ethics would be for a newlywed couple to use contraception because they're not yet financially capable of caring for children. 
Yet contraception is always morally evil, no matter the circumstances. Fundamental option is the theory of those who hold that a person commits mortal sin only when he has the intention of rejecting God. An example of this would be when a couple engages in premarital sex, believing themselves to be expressing love rather than rejecting God. However, the church teaches that when a person knowingly and willfully does anything which is seriously against God's law, a mortal sin is always committed, no matter the sinner's intentions. As Catholics, it's our responsibility to have a positive impact on culture and society, to change it however we can in a way that leads mankind to God. Our individual acts that seem insignificant work in a conglomerate way to change the world. It's our responsibility to form a right conscience in accordance with Christ's teachings, as passed on to us through His Holy Catholic Church. We have to stop justifying what we want and begin doing as we ought and have frequent recourse to the sacrament of penance. The counterculture has become the prevailing culture, and it's our responsibility to become the new counterculture to bring the return of a Christian culture. Our modern culture is the devil, and we must resist him firm in our faith in order to stop him. It's time to stop caring about what's politically correct or about what society thinks and care more about what God thinks. Here's something I'm going to shout loud and long. During the last two years, every Catholic parish and most businesses lost a ton of money because of the COVID lockdowns. Congress attempted to ease the revenue strain with the CARES Act, but it really did nothing for parishes and little for most businesses. Believe it or not, Congress is actually remedying that. They've not done a good job of getting the word out, but Congress has enhanced the ERTC portion of the CARES Act. If a parish or business has W-2 employees, part-time or full-time, they almost certainly qualify for the ERTC tax rebate. I'm working with a CPA firm that specializes in ERTC rebates to reach out to all parishes and Catholic-owned businesses I can. This is especially good for parishes with schools. All any parish or Catholic-owned business has to do is click the link in my show notes that says ERTC Recovery, I Want My Money. Then just fill out the form on the website and the CPA firm will determine if the parish or business qualifies. It costs nothing to get started and the average tax rebate appears to be $150,000. So tell every priest and Catholic business owner about the expanded ERTC rebate and send them to my show notes. Remember, click the link on my show notes that says ERTC Recovery, I Want My Money. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. John Paul the Great. He said, The future starts today, not tomorrow. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Anthony Collins was an 18th century free thinker. One day he met a simple farmer going to church. He asked him where he was going. To church, sir, was the answer. What are you going to do there? I'm going to worship God. Tell me. Is your God great or a little God? He's both, sir, answered the farmer. How can that be? He's so great, sir, that heaven can't contain him, and so little that he can come to live in my heart. Collins declared that this simple answer had more influence on his mind than all of the volumes that learned writers had written against him. 
The same truth was expressed during World War II when a group of British and American prisoners of war limped barefoot and ragged into a British camp in the Pacific after a march of 60 miles from a Japanese prison camp. Their first request wasn't food, clothing, a shower, bandages, or medical attention. Their first request, expressed by an American officer, was that mass be said for the group. Without their breakfast, without a shower, or any comfort at all, those tired boys knelt around the altar and attended Holy Mass. Every single one received Holy Communion. To receive Jesus in communion is the most wonderful thing that can happen to you because it means having the infinitely great God in your own heart. The Holy Eucharist is the greatest and holiest of the sacraments because it contains God himself. How great his love must be for you that he'd stoop so low to reach you. Do you appreciate Holy Communion as the farmer and the soldiers did? This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.